Hi folks, I'm Jack Kennedy and welcome to episode 4 of Farm Tech Talks. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the support of MSD Animal Health, FVD, Ornua and Bordbia. Our intention is to create an engaging platform to share the stories of the week. For this discussion, I'd like to welcome our editor, Justin McCarthy, our news editor, Katrina Morrissey, and our agribusiness editor, Lorcan Allen. We'll record a separate session with our livestock specialists after this. Katrina, maybe if I could come to you first, it's been a week like no other in farming circles. Give us a summary of what happened. Yeah, I suppose it's a week, as you say, like no other farming has changed completely, was changed completely by the Taoiseach's announcement last Friday night. Since then, we have farmers carrying ID. Uh, we have marts closed and subsequently reopened again uh, in a different format, but nonetheless opened again. We have uh, farm workers having to carry letters to say that they are essential workers. And we have guards on the road making sure that everybody is only going doing the essential tasks, which obviously food production is one of the chief ones. Yeah, but and again, at the back of it all, despite all those changes, farming is continuing as normal and we're lucky it's an essential, an essential service, as deemed an essential service in terms of food production and farming. I suppose the big the big story I see in your pages this week is, that, I suppose, the collapse in beef prices. Give us a, give us a flavour of that, of that piece, how it moves through your pages. Yeah, so as, as Bela Moniel reports in this week's paper, um, burger and steaks, we're really seeing the impact now on the closure of the McDonald's restaurants, the closure of all restaurants really in, in the UK and across Europe, and that's impacting heavily on the, the meat that would be destined for those burgers and steaks. So we've got 50% of our beef in Ireland goes into manufacturing and food service, which is basically restaurants and fast food chains. And that no longer has the market, and uh, it has resulted in a, in a big cut in price for cows. 15, 20 cents a kilo gone off the price of cows in the last week, and also steers and heifers down 10 cents a kilo. Okay, thanks, Katrina. With that in mind, um, I said I talked to the boss of Borbia, Tara McCarthy, this week to get her thoughts, I suppose, on the market and what Borbia are going to do. So Jack, what we've been doing is looking at our own website to see what are consumers looking to cook. And when they've been coming onto our website, they've been looking for almost comforting meals like recipes for stews, for honey glazed hams, for garlic roast potatoes. And what we've been looking then and seeing at retail level is where the uplift is in the cuts that they're looking for, which has very much been around mince, around stewing meats, that type of product. The challenge obviously the industry is facing is that in restaurants, people were eating steak cuts and they've been severely impacted by it. So when we're looking at that, what we've been now trying to create and we'll be launching it on Saturday night is a new quality comfort ad. And this is a 30 second TV ad that we're going to be encouraging the public to cook that familiar food, to cook that nutritious meals at home using quality Irish food. And I guess from that perspective, what we've done is the first ever dedicated steak TV ad advert on the home market. Traditionally, we'd have been focusing all of that effort onto international markets. But given the unique circumstances, there'll be a, a TV ad on, uh, on RTE and on all of the, the media outlets supporting the, the stake campaigns. But everything is around quality comforts. But what we've also been doing then is trying to look at our own quality kitchen cook-alongs. So that's on the board via website where we're creating a social media campaign. And we've asked since last Saturday on the 27th, many well-known Irish chefs, including the likes of Evan Maguire, Catherine Fulvio, Rory O'Connell, each of them then to look at a classic recipe from the Borbia website on borbia.ie recipes and actually then looking for those quality assured products, the in-season Irish ingredients and to direct consumers who have more time to cook as much Irish food as possible. What we've also been doing, Jack, is adjusting our other campaigns. So we've been uh, we've changed the timing of our pork campaign, of our lamb campaigns to bring them forward as well. So for the next number of weeks that we'll have more or less blanket coverage of quality assured product on Irish consumers TVs. 
Okay, good to hear, as you say, some new measures as well as, I suppose, adjusting of the existing uh, promotional activity. Uh, live exports is another one, Tara, that I suppose, you know, again, we, we're not long back from a, from a trade mission to um, Egypt and Algeria. Live exports are important, and I suppose those countries are depending on Irish product and, and other South American product, etc. as well, you know. But in terms of like live exports, I, can you update us maybe in terms of what your expectations are over the next couple of months? The calf trade is very the calf export trade is very important at the moment and there has been some downward momentum on that. So maybe just in terms of live exports, what's the expectations as far as Board B are concerned? Yeah, so if we go through the data of that again, it was a very challenging opening of the year and that was very much driven by weather conditions where a number of boats were cancelled. But surprisingly, I guess, for, for, for many people, if you look at year to date to the 21st of March, we were at over 88 thousand head um, that were exported at that point, which was on a par with the previous year. Now, you're dead right, Jack, that we've been putting an awful lot of effort into international markets with that trip to Algeria, previous trips to Turkey. And there ha that has started to bear fruit. And there's already been several shipments out to Libya that have taken place. And there's more vessels scheduled for Turkey and Algeria. Um, also, one of the previous bottlenecks that um, that our industry had faced was in the Lairages in Sherbrooke. And again, they've expanded. So while we're currently at around or up until uh, the week before last, we were up at around 15,000 calves a week. They now can cope with 17,000 calves a week. So, so that issue has been addressed. However, without a doubt, COVID-19 has had an impact on this most particularly when you look at where is our product going. And we have two big European markets, the Netherlands and Spain. And I know you've been covering it yourselves in most recent editions. Netherlands is where we'd be most concerned because their market, which again brings me back to that food service issue, fundamentally the Netherlands veal market is an export market to food service and their key markets are Italy, France and Germany. And again, that they're facing into a, a negative headstorm, I guess, with regard to demand for their product. Countering that, you've got Spain. And Spain, whilst there, I guess the buyer outlook is a little bit uncertain. They're not sure what's happening. They're still remaining robust in their demand. Um, a little bit of pressure, pressure on price, but the feedback is that the quality of Irish calves that are reaching that market are very, very good and worth paying for. And I guess that's probably because those calves have been on farm a little bit longer. Um, so from that perspective, they're arri arriving in a very healthy condition to the market. Yeah, so as you say, the prospects are good for the Spanish piece and under pressure for the for the Dutch um, for the Dutch calf trade. Um, to maybe bring it back to, I mean, again, Borbia is central to the quality assurance piece here in Ireland, and I get the feeling that some farmers are not fully tuned into the changes that you've made as a result of the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Can you maybe just briefly outline, kind of, in terms of the the, the quality assurance piece, uh, what, what changes have been made? Absolutely. Um, so we were very, very concerned and, and, and so much of this is, again, the only motivation on this is the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we were concerned about is having any risk of cross-contamination or contamination on our farms. So what we decided um, uh, last week or the 10 days ago at this stage was actually to postpone and extend uh, the certification of all farms. So for the next uh, 60 days that there would be no audits undertaken by Borbia on those farms. And what we've done is that those farms have not gone out of certification. We've extended by 60 days that, that certification process. And we've obviously informed all of the authorities because we obviously are at the heart of this is to ensure that consumers, that certification audits, etc., remain confident of the robust systems on Irish farms and of the audit process itself. So what we've done now is to extend those certifications and we're very, very happy with that and that has been well received by all. What we're now looking to make sure though is that there's no backlog because obviously if you stop auditing for that 60 days, then you're building up a lot of work to do. And what we're trying to make sure is that that time is being used well and that we're doing an awful lot of the paperwork behind the scenes so that we make sure no farmer is at risk of falling out of certification because of a backlog. It's it's early April, Tara, and uh, Easter lamb is, is is going to be on the menu, I suppose, for the next for the next couple of weeks. Um, it's a critical time for the for the sheep trade, for the lamb trade. Uh, again, is is there special promotional activity that Board B are undertaking in the next couple of weeks? 
Absolutely. Um, so Quality Assured Irish Lamb is, is part of the, the promotional campaign. Easter is always a very, very good time and all of the retailers are support, supporting the promotion of lamb in that period. Obviously, straight after that, you've got Ramadan, which would be another lamb um, promotional opportunity. Uh, that's the 23rd of April to the 23rd of May. And our network of overseas offices are very much in close contact with the commercial buyers and with the importers so that we can promote Irish lamb when normal trading conditions um, uh, obviously are back in place. But I guess from our perspective, we're including the under that quality comforts ad that I spoke to you previously, clearly lamb is going to be featured in that. So that would be over the three week period from the 4th of April to the 24th of April. And what we're all is we're forwarding our lamb specific new season lamb TV campaign. That will be on then from the 1st to the 21st of June. And we'll already be planning a second burst of that at the second half of the year as well. So what we're looking to do is make sure that the home market is protected and is very much supporting the quality lamb messaging. But obviously that our overseas office networking are also working very closely with those international buyers to have lamb first choice as well. Okay, Justin, maybe to move to you with, with those thoughts of Tara ringing in our mind, in terms of the challenge, obviously it's huge. Um, and obviously, Board B, are, in fairness, are reacting and they're changing their protocols in terms of promotional and creating new promotional material. Is, is there anything that I suppose Europe can do in this, in this time of the pandemic? Is there something that you see that Europe can either do collectively or individually in terms of supports to other countries? Look, uh, Jack, the key thing I would take from Tara's uh, piece there is that markets do recover after coronavirus. We've seen the Chinese market effectively close down for a period, and we are seeing green shoots starting to emerge. China are coming back onto the market, albeit in a slow way uh, for agricultural commodities. And I think there is a real message here at, at, at what is, I suppose, the eye of the storm that we're in at the minute here in Ireland that we can take hope that markets will come back and markets actually come back quite quickly. This is a 10, 12 week period. Katrina talked about the food service market uh, being collapsed, but you can be rest assured McDonald's are going to reopen. You can be rest assured that uh, restaurants are going to be reopened. And I know if, uh, if the rest of society is anything like me, I'd only too delighted to be able to get out of the house to go for, 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 for a meal some evening. So that demand is going, is going to come back. And you talk about what Europe can do. Of course, there's a lot Europe can do. It can, do, it can prove to all member states the power of the union. And I think that's what I was referring to in the lead editorial uh, in, in, in this week's paper. This crisis presents one of the greatest threats and the greatest opportunities to the European Union. The greatest threat is that it does not get this right. And member states come out of this crisis, this horrific crisis for a lot of member states, uh, Jack, and feel that Europe didn't stand by them. And that would be a disaster for the European project. But where the opportunity exists is for Europe to show the power of solidarity here uh, and to show it across all member states at a societal level and then at an economic level uh, as well. And obviously the societal level comes first, but there will come a time where it will come uh, at an economic level. And obviously farmers are a section of society that are hugely impacted by this. And as we talked about last week, Jack, I think we need to be innovative and we need to be fast paced here because this is a short, sharp uh, disturbance to the market, not a prolonged thing where there, there is no end in sight. And we can look to China and see that there is an end in sight. And we would Europe and indeed the Minister for Agriculture who now, uh, thanks to uh, relaxation of rules at a European level, uh, has flexi huge flexibility to support farmers at a national level. And we, we would be very clear that certainly uh, given the hit that Katrina talked about earlier in terms of the beef uh, and the dairy, and of course the land trade where, where, where hoggets are back up to 15 euros ahead, a that there is tools there uh, that, that could intervene in the market. And if the tools aren't there, well, let's design the tools for this exceptional period that we're in. Uh, certainly from a dairy point of view, we do need some sort of a mechanism that will, if God forbids, that processing capacity is restricted, that supports farmers uh, at a, in a targeted way for any milk that may not be processed. We've highlighted before in terms of the beef and sheep, why can we not leave our, uh, encourage farmers to leave our beef animals in the field and introduce a support payment for the second half of the year to underpin the market and give those farmers confidence to delay the throughput of cattle. So ultimately, Jack, there is 
huge amount Europe can do both at a societal level and at an economic level, but it needs to do it, it needs to do it quickly. And if it does do it, I think it's one of the greatest examples and the greatest opportunities for the European Union to show why, why the member states are better together than any level of fragment, fragmentation. Okay, I see one suggestion, Justin, in terms of a, a possible option is to, is to maybe lock out non-EU food out of the EU. Surely something like that is unlikely. Jack, that would only be in the context that if there are, on the counter, there are people and, 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 and organisations promoting putting uh, beef into storage. It would be lunacy, lunacy to, for us to be putting European product into storage and, and for beef to be coming in. And I think something that's often missed in this, Jack, is the extent to which uh, current or other countries have devalued their currency, which gives them a huge competitive advantage within the European Union and the disruption that that uh, is in the European Union. As, as Philip O'Neill calculated for me recently, if the, if the uh, Ar Argentinian currency had it been the same level as it was today versus five, just five years ago, Argentinian beef price would be six euros a kilo. It's a fraction of that because of the devaluation of the currency. So we need to look at other uh, externalities as, as factors out there that are driving it. But I think first and foremost, Jack, that needs to be looked at, but there also needs to be looked at as a measure of how can we prevent putting product into storage, particularly beef? I have no less issue with it in dairy because dairy is a long life product that doesn't devalue. Uh, but beef, the first thing you do with beef when you put it into storage is you freeze it and you devalue it automatically by 30%. And then that product has to come onto the market in the second half of the year. So you create a 12, what could be as short as a 12 week problem, you turn it into a 12 month problem. Okay, Larkin, uh Justin has mentioned the dairy side of things. I mean, this week in the agribusiness pages, you outlined the, the, the financial results of Dairy Gold Co-op, one of the big players, I suppose, in the dairy industry in, here in Ireland, you know, close on 3,000 milk suppliers down in the heart of it in Cork, Tipperary. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a big part of the, of the dairy chain. Maybe give us a flavour of the numbers and I suppose a little bit of the understanding behind the Dairy Gold results that were released this week. Sure, Jack. Yeah, a very strong uh, set of financial results actually in 2019 for Dairy Gold um, and very much driven by that continuing growth in milk supply. So Dairy Gold processed over just under 1.4 billion litres of milk last year. It's a record volume of milk uh, continues to grow and, and that you know, extra volume um, allowed them to saw their turnover increase past the 1 billion euro mark for the very first time. You know, it's a it's a it's a kind of a, a milestone for the for the co-op to to have sold such a volume of product. But I suppose most importantly, strong growth in profits last year, double digit growth in profits, uh, operating profits up 24 percent to 36 million euros. Um, and it leaves Dairy Gold in a, in a healthy financial position. Um, now, in saying that, there's still a bit of debt on, 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 on the books as well from all the expansion and the capacity that they've had to build over the last number of years. So. Um, They've, you know, they, they over the last decade they've spent over 400 million euros on uh, milk processing uh, capacity, uh, which is a lot, but um, very much manageable over the next number of years uh, when when things get back to normal. So, I mean, would would you get a, would you get would you get the feeling that it's it was money well spent in terms of is, is it good debt? I mean, we we all talk about debt and you know where if it's money well spent, you know it it'll lead to a better f future for the business. So you, you're comfortable, you know that 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 money has been spent in terms of being able to take in more milk to process that milk with say further suppliers. No, absolutely. It's money well spent. It's it's allowed them to be able to handle all the milk that's uh, come since the end of quarters. And they have enough capacity to get them out to 2023 at the minute. The next phase for um, Dairy Gold will be f future expansion. They've recently done the census of their members to get a sense of what the future growth may look like among members. And they're, you know, the, the discussion will start to be how they're going to fund that extra expansion that may be needed after 2023 and who's going to pay for it. And I suppose just in relation to that, Jack, some good news as well for Dairy Gold shareholders this week, uh, the co-op announcing that it's going to pay back about €5 million Euro this year between um, money coming back out of its revolving fund and return of loan notes that uh, maybe some shareholders would have invested in. Um, so over €700,000 would have been paid out this week to people who have invested in the loan notes. And in August, about €4.2 million Euro will be paid out to shareholders, all shareholders who would have had to contribute to the co-op's revolving fund. And those payments will continue over the next five years, which is a bonus for Dairy Gold shareholders to see some of their cash coming back after investing in the co-op uh, back in 2013, for 2014, 2015. 
Yeah. Um, You touched off it and Justin touched off it in terms of processing capacity. I mean, one of the issues highlighted this week was the fact that maybe maybe not steel processing capacity, but that actually people capacity at peak mill processing, you know, because if if a if a potential plant got caught with COVID-19 and there was absenteeism, etc. There was there, there's been talk of that, and I suppose we've seen internationally, we've seen moves in the US, the UK, and France in terms of, you know, maybe dumping milk, etc., that kind of thing. Maybe where, Where's your thoughts on that in terms of where we are, Lorcan, and how it might impact on Irish farmers? Yeah, uh, so, so what we're hearing from the industry is this is not a stainless steel issue, it's a, it's a HR issue, it's a people issue, and it's, um, you know, what happens when members of staff get infected with COVID-19, some of their colleagues are forced to self-isolate, and then other people in the plant may say that it's not worth my health risking going into work for the company. So they're kind of modeling out that absentee r- uh, rates rises quite significantly um, at their plants over the coming weeks because the COVID-19 is going to coincide with the peak of milk supply. And they're very worried about the risk that that poses to um, their, their, their milk processing sites been able to continue. And we're seeing this across other countries now as well, starting to happen. Videos emerging from the US, different parts of the US, from Wisconsin, a really strong dairy state, all the way down to the Southeast in Georgia of farmers having to dump milk. Um, a lot of this is mostly related in the US to the market. Uh, the food service market is enormous in the US. You know, 50% of all food eaten in the US is eaten out of home. And with all the closure of the, those restaurants and everything like that, um, you've just seen a collapse in basically the route to market for a lot of dairy and dairy processors in the U.S. telling farmers, we don't want your milk, we've got no market for it. And I suppose that's just how rootless I, mean, I suppose the U.S. system is that farmers have no option but to just dump the milk. Um, and we've also seen in France as well, you know, the co-ops are urging farmers maybe to uh, cut back on production. One co- uh, you know, some, some are offering to pay them not to produce milk. Uh, and in the U.K. as well, we're starting to see some, some issues because of... Um, uh, you know, out of contract liquid milk suppliers, uh, uh, t- too much milk basically flowing around uh, for what the market actually demands at the minute. So it's a sad, mm. sad sight, but it, it's starting to emerge in other countries. Okay, Larkin, thanks for that. Quick one, Justin, before we go, um, I suppose, how, how are things in terms of the journal uh, continuing to move along? Continuing to move along, Jack, obviously we're, we're missing you and, and not having that witty banter in the office, but look, we're spread across 32 counties. Uh, technology is phenomenal. We have planned for an event like this, hoped it would never be needed. But look, uh, the journal is continuing to go to press every every Wednesday evening on the shops every, every Thursday morning. It, it, it is challenging, but I suppose, look, the team are kept going by the level of encouragement they get uh, every day, every week from our from our readers, where it be on uh, text message, on emails or, or, or whatever, on social media. And look, we really, we really appreciate that. Look, Jack, we, we, we can do this in the Farmer's Journal. We can do this as farmers. And as, the, as, as we all roll up our sleeves, I'm more and more confident that we will do this. And it's great to see Irish society doing what it does best and coming together to take on a challenge. And there's no doubt we'll beat this. Um, uh, and we will get through it. And as I said in a, a video earlier on the week, we will go back to the marks and uh, we will go back talking to our neighbours and uh, just let's knuckle down for the next short period and uh, hopefully we'll get back to normality soon. Okay, thanks for that, Justin. Um, once again, it's been a pleasure. Thanks to our guests today, Tara, Katrina, Justin and Lorcan. I'll be chatting to the livestock team in the next episode of Farm Tech Talks. Uh, so listen into that if you want to get their views in terms of what's happening in the field. Once again, thanks to Warnua, FVD, um, MSD Animal Health and Borbia for making this outside broadcast happen. Stay safe and safe farming.